Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Wednesday, June 19th, 2013, and here are our top stories. Tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News, the Russian cyberspace head calls for the internet kill switch. Then, will the EPA allow even more toxins to reach your dinner plate? And the official TWA 800 story comes crashing down. All that and more coming up on the InfoWars Nightly News. I mean, just over-the-top authoritarian scum. Well, when government fails or when it acts criminally, they always use that as an excuse to make government bigger. And that's true of other governments as well. The Russian government now is using the U.S. snooping as an excuse to extend a Internet kill switch. In an article by Paul Joseph Watson on InfoWars, Russian cyberspace head calls for Internet kill switch. The head of Russia's cyberspace policy today called for global governments to react to the NSA spy scandal by creating a UN-style body that would have regulatory control over the Internet, including a web kill switch. During a speech at a specially arranged meeting initiated by the upper house of the Russian parliament, Information Society Development Commission head Ruslan Gatarov called for a newly created group to control the World Wide Web, quote, so that everyone, not only the U.S., has access to the master switch. As Alex Newman reported, the controversial plan discussed at the conference would allow governments to shut down the web if they claimed it could interfere with the internal affairs of other UN member regimes. Now, this is nothing new. For several years now, every few months, the UN has been pushing for just this sort of thing. They just had a conference in May 14th through 16th in Geneva. It was the Fifth World Telecommunications Policy Forum, and it was run by the UN's ITU. So they've been trying to get the Internet under UN control, where they could shut it down at any time for quite some time. But who needs a kill switch when you can just go in and accuse people of a copyright violation, as they did with Mega Upload, and take everything that they've got? And now they have deleted that. In an article from RT, Kim.com says, all Mega Upload servers are wiped out, have been wiped out without warning in a data massacre. Kim.com has accused the U.S. government and LeaseWeb, one of the hosting providers of former file-sharing site Mega Upload, of deleting millions of personal files without warning. This is the largest data massacre in the history of the Internet, .com wrote on Twitter. Lawyers representing the, his former company have repeatedly asked LeaseWeb not to delete Mega Upload servers while court proceedings are pending in the U.S., he said. My goal is, within the next five years, I want to encrypt half of the internet just reestablish a balance between a person an individual and the state he said in an interview because right now we're living very close to this vision of George Orwell and I think it's not the right way it's the wrong path that the government is on thinking that they can spy on everyone and that's a key thing because in this situation his case is still before trial and so what they've essentially done is destroy the evidence they have still have to prove their case that he's violated their copyright and there's a lot of information that's there a lot of personal information that is of course not copyrighted that all has been destroyed right down the memory hole but the encouraging thing is that there are a lot of internet entrepreneurs a lot of people who are tech savvy like kim.com who are now working to try to reestablish as he said a balance between the individual and the state now of course the internet is part of a battle It's part of the war for your mind it's actually part of a kind of a cold war this cold war is really not between nation states it's between the individuals and the governments who seem to be teaming up as we saw from the first article with russia and the u.n against individuals everywhere yeah a world government a new world order and as part of that cold war there is a strategic high ground that high ground is your privacy and your data if you don't own that privacy you don't own that data the government has a much easier time of controlling you. But in a Cold War, people still die. 
And we just learned today that Michael Hastings, a journalist who was very instrumental in bringing General McChrystal's career to an end and exposing things that were happening in Afghanistan, died in what was called a fiery crash. Rolling Stone magazine called Michael Hastings a fearless journalist who refused to cozy up to power. His death at 33 came by way of a fire-fueled and explosive crash. It sounded like a bomb went off in the middle of the night. My house shook, the windows were rattling. Couldn't have written a scene like this for a movie where the engine flies from the car, which was about, I don't know, 50, 60 yards up, right down here to this telephone pole. Yeah, you couldn't write a scene like that for the movies. Why? Because nobody would believe it. You have to have a certain amount of credibility even in a fictional movie but the story that's being sold by the mainstream media, that he was going at a very high rate of speed and his car burst into flames, just doesn't make any sense if you look at the evidence. First of all, look at that engine that he had there. He's pointing to the engine. It's not scathed at all by a fire. And it also, if you look at the pictures of the car, it is not deformed. It's up against a tree, but there's not anything there that is, uh, that the car is not smashed up. Uh, and there's a lot of, lot of questions about this, but first let's take a look at some of the statistics about how likely is it that someone's going to die in a fiery crash. Well, according to FEMA statistics, there's only about 70 to 80 vehicle fires a year, and they say that there's only two out of a thousand of the vehicle fires that people die in. That's a 0.2% chance of dying. Of course, as Darren McBreen pointed out, if you're a honest journalist, pointing out things that the government or powerful men are doing that are wrong, your chances go up significantly higher than 0.2%. But this is a very, very unusual case. If you look at the pictures, if you look at what's, what was said, first of all, the woman said it sounded like a bomb. Now, one of the reasons why so few people die in a fiery crash is because usually a crash, the people that die are pinned in a car that has uh, crashed into something and they can't get out and the engine starts to uh, catch fire with leaking gas. That was not the case here, because you can see the car, the picture of the car, it is not deformed. It's not deformed, it was not struck in the back, it is up against a tree, but very little of the car is deformed, and as he said, the engine was thrown 50 to 60 yards away. Now, in an article by Jim Stone, freelance journalist at uh, jimstonefreelance.com, he points out some of these issues. And he talks about how the rear passenger door is blown open and shredded with the rest of the car nicely intact. And he says, unlike the so-called single eyewitness report that says the car, the car did not impact a tree. And you can look at that picture of the car against the tree and you can tell that it was not smashed flat. It, and it would be smashed flat if it hit that tree and of course the engine would not be ejected. He said, uh, look at where it stopped. There's not much damage to it. And, of course, there's no damage to the rear part of the car. And he points out from those pictures that it looks like the rear part of the car, the very first pictures that were taken, show paint still on the car. As you see the last picture there, uh, pretty much all of the paint has been burned off. But the, the fire is concentrated towards the back of the car. And that just isn't what happens in a fiery crash. Typically, it's some kind of an engine malfunction. Usually, it's such a low death rate with fiery crashes, usually it's because somebody has time to pull over their engine, catches fire, they pull over, they get out of the car, they call the fire department, they come there. It's only when they get pinned in a crash, but the car is not smashed up that way. So, uh, very, very unusual circumstances with that uh, crash, and frankly, it just doesn't look like the narrative makes any sense. Only one person said he was going at a high rate of speed. And certainly if he was going at a high rate of speed, you would expect to see much more damage done to the chassis of the car. Now his last article that Michael Hastings wrote was why Democrats love to spy on America. He was a reporter for BuzzFeed at the time. And he says, besides Senators Ron Wyden and Mark Udall, most Democrats have abandoned their civil liberty positions during the age of Obama. With a new leak investigation looming, Democrat leadership is now being forced to confront all the secrets that they've tried to hide. And he says, Glenn Greenwald's exposure of the NSA's massive domestic spy program has revealed the entire cast of current Democrat leaders as a gang of civil liberty opportunists, couldn't have said it better, whose true passion, it seems, was in trolling George W. Bush for eight years on matters of national security, not wanting to do anything 
on their own. They've completely changed the narrative. So as he points out, with the exception of just a couple of senators, Ron Wyden and uh, Udall, the Democrats have been as bad, if not worse, than George Bush. They're just using it for political advantage, as we see. And they're locking arms with their warmongering Republican colleagues, as we see with this next article from Dianne Feinstein and Mike Rogers. Now, of course, Feinstein is the Senate Intelligence Committee head, and Mike Rogers is her correspondent in the House, and he has been pushing over and over again CISPA. And they're trying to make a case that the spying is necessary. They're trying to make a case that they've actually stopped terrorist events. And they're having a very hard time doing it because the facts are somewhat contradictory. As Kurt Nemo, Nemo points out in InfoWars, he says on Tuesday, Feinstein said there are no hearings currently planned on the NSA scandal and nothing will happen until the intelligence community decides, quote, what can be said, unquote, about the massive and unprecedented violation of the Fourth Amendment. Obama also said that the NSA program has the oversight of the court. He refrained from mentioning that the court involved is a secret FISA court, itself an unconstitutional aberration created as a response to decades of constitutional abuse by intelligence agencies. And on Wednesday, Obama tried to defend the Stasi state with its unwarranted intrusion. He said, lives have been saved, he claimed, speaking in Berlin, where he met with his counterpart, German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Well, you know, I'm reminded of the Newsweek, March 2009, it was when Obama took office and they came out with the headline that said, we are all socialists now. Well, I guess more specifically, the kind of socialists that we are, are East German Stasi socialists. That's the kind of state we've set up, except we have technology and the government has power that the East German Stasi could only dream of. It gives them a chance to look into every aspect of your life and put together an entire picture of you and basically keep that information forever so they can go back and uh, blackmail people with it. They can blackmail, let's say, Supreme Court judges. People have, uh, have suggested that maybe that happened with the Obamacare decision. They can take down directors even of the CIA with information that they glean from their personal account. What can they do with you? Well, time will tell. Now. We also have an article on InfoWars that says, no, the NSA spying did not prevent a terror attack on Wall Street. And this article from InfoWars, it says, in response to the revelation that the NSA has been illeg illegally spying on all Americans for more than a decade, NSA Chief General Keith Alexander claimed that the spying prevented a terrorist attack on Wall Street and the New York subway. However, Mr. Ozani pleaded guilty to providing material support this is the guy that they're using as an example. In his case, money to Al-Qaeda and not to terror planning. His May 2010 plea agreement makes no mention of anything related to the New York Stock Exchange or to any bomb plot. And his defense attorney said Tuesday that the stock market allegation was news to him. So all he did was he gave money. And how much money did he give? Well, $23,000. That is far less money than the CIA has given to Al-Qaeda far, far less. Just a few of the weapons that we give them continuously would be many times more than that. And it bears repeating to say that the first time that Feinstein and Mike Rogers got together the Sunday uh, news show after the first revelations about PRISM and data mining, they were trying to make a case, again, as they're still trying to make a case, trying to find something that uh, they prevented by illegally and unconstitutionally spying on people. And in that particular case, they were talking about Najibullah Zazi uh, and that failed attempt. And actually, that guy, who really was a terrorist, was caught by standard detective work. And it wasn't even American detective work. It was out of the UK where that case was broken. Now, the question is, if no one is watching the watchers, and they aren't, then how do you keep the watchers from watching you? You know, we've got uh, Google Glass coming online, and a lot of people are concerned about increased invasions of privacy because it won't just be the surveillance cameras that are everywhere. It's going to be people walking around with Google Glasses on, feeding this up to the Internet, to Google servers, which we have now learned are being tapped and analyzed and stored by the NSA. Now, a lot of people are angry about that. They're calling these uh, people who might wear Google Glasses uh, glass holes, <laughs> I guess we could say that. Um, 
And, but there's another way that you can uh, fight this besides just ridiculing people who are doing it and trying to make it a socially unacceptable practice. We've got this report out of Japan, and these people are actually they're working on a way to confuse face recognition even with infrared cameras. This is the world's first pair of glasses which prevent facial recognition by cameras. They are currently under development by Japan's National Institute of Informatics. Photos taken without people's knowledge can violate privacy. For example, photos may be posted online, along with metadata including the time and location. But by wearing this device, you can stop your privacy from being infringed in such ways. Now, as you can see in that video, they have uh, people looking into a computer monitor at the same time they're being face scanned. And when the computer monitor can recognize their face and lock in on it, they get a green bar or a green square around it. And as soon as they turn on the infrared LEDs, that goes away, it confuses it. Now, he's saying that there, of course, there are other types of cameras that can be used to identify you, do face recognition, and they're working on alternative ways to defeat that as well. And I think they're going to have a really strong market for that, especially if they put them in, let's say, a Guy Fox mask. We'll see how that develops. The important thing about the Pro One filter today is that the material we use for removing fluoride and other heavy metals now will remove the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid. There's no other fluoride reduction filter out there that will remove that type of fluoride. And it's extremely important because Today, we're hearing more and more cities are using that form of fluoride. We've been having medication forced on us through the water system for quite a while. Most people don't realize it. Most people don't realize the negative effects of fluoride. There's a wide range of health effects that are attributed to fluoride. Bottom line, why should somebody get this new Pro One Pro Pure filter? The reason to buy the Pro One, it's an all-in-one filter. It's convenient, easy to use. It doesn't require the add-on fluoride filter, and in addition, this filter removes the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid.